Hello, everyone. Happy holidays. Welcome to December. We made it. Excellent. Okay. We're going to pick this up and start going here. I'm going to do a quick little introduction. Then I'm going to turn it over to Chef John and uh, Chad Cooper over at Nate's uh, Ernest Kitchen. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Nate's Virtual Alumni Lifelong Learning Event Holiday Dessert Cooking Demo with Chef John Harris and Chad Cooper. We're going to start off with a little land acknowledgement here. As is our tradition at Nate, we honor and acknowledge that the land on which we learn, work, and live is Treaty 6 territory. We seek to learn from history and the lessons that have come before us and to draw on the wisdom of Canada's first peoples. Only through learning can we move forward in truth and reconciliation and to a better future together. My name is Stephen Brochu. I'm a proud Nate alumnus and member of Nate Nate's Alumni Association Advisory Committee. Today, I'm happy to serve as your host. Before we get cooking, we have a couple housekeeping notes. We are going to be recording this. So just, you know, be mindful of what you're sharing on your screen. Try and keep us in your kitchen. That's easy to do. Uh, Upon entry, your microphone was automatically muted. However, we encourage you to turn on your microphone and your video. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> we encourage you to turn your video on so we can see what's happening in your kitchen. Uh, if you post about tonight's uh, cooking class, uh, you can tag Ernest and the Nate alumni on Instagram. Please feel free to use the chat feature for any questions. We'll direct those towards Chef John and Chad. And as Nate alumni, you are automatically members of the Nate Alumni Association. The Alumni Association has benefits like today's event and other events, discounts and services. Today's event is sponsored by our affinity program partner, TD Insurance, Melcor Monex. As alumni, you receive preferred rates on TD home and auto insurance. Awesome. For more information, visit the alumni website. And without further ado, let's get cooking. Chef John and Chad, take us away. Thank you very much. I'm Chad Cooper. I'm one of the maitre d's here at Ernest. I'm going to pass it off to the much more talented Chef John. Um, John, go ahead. Okay, well, absolutely welcome to everybody. Wendy, hi to you as well. I have a screen over here. So if you ever see me pointing over here or looking over here, it's because I have a screen where I can see everybody's or most people's beautiful faces as well as the chat. So if you have any questions, please hit me up in the chat. Tammy, thank you so much. Stephen, thank you so much for the honor to be able to uh, help everyone celebrate the holidays a little bit more with making our own eggnog. So that's going to be our cocktail for the evening. If you want to keep it mocktail, meaning no alcohol, then just don't add any alcohol. And Chad will cover how to uh, spice it up so that it tastes a little bit more like the eggnog with rum or bourbon or whatever your choice is uh, for that. So we're going to make the eggnog from scratch. And then also as well, we have dark chocolate truffles. And you can coat them in anything you want. I've recommended cocoa powder. And what's nice about that is the dark chocolate truffles are really super sweet. The cocoa is really bitter and they kind of yin yang together to make a complete picture of heaven in my mind personally. So hopefully everybody is excited to do eggnog and dark chocolate truffles. Quick to ask everybody, has anybody ever made any of these kinds of things before? Okay. And I'll just mention too, for if anyone wants for chat, you do have the option to direct it just privately to us. Mm -hmm. um, just in case for any reason you want to be a little bit uh, more discreet, don't be afraid. Um, we'll keep that there and we can just answer it as a general question for you. Cool. So Emily, you made truffles but years ago. Lavelle, the same. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> Very cool. They're not difficult to make. I think that's the surprising thing really about any of this is that it's super simple to make, um, but I guess with convenience products. Colette, very cool. Alice, new. Marilyn, never made it either. Okay. Um, it's super easy to do. 
Okay, and what, that's what we're going to find out here. Just a, a, a few simple ingredients, very easy to do. Um, but I guess with convenience products, we don't think about it. I just go to the store, I buy eggnog. <clears throat> or I just go to the store and buy a truffle, which I guess is a little less. <clears throat> but you'll see here that you get a much better product when you make it yourself. Um, so let's go ahead and grab our recipes and go over the ingredients that we're going to need. And then we'll go over how we're going to approach this because... It's easy stuff, but it involves a few steps. So we have for the eggnog itself, six egg yolks, 125 grams of white sugar. So here, Chad, if you want to change to my uh, upper. Oh yeah, let's do uh, camera two here. Boom. So right here in this bowl, I have my six egg yolks. If you're concerned at all about the egg whites, I have these actually saved right here in this bowl. We can use these for another use. You could make anything you want with them. One of the things we can do is we can whip that into a meringue and incorporate it back into the eggnog so that we're not wasting any egg whites. 125 grams of white sugar. And then I have a combination of 375 milliliters of whole milk and 125 milliliters of heavy cream. And one of the cool things about this recipe is you can play with this amount to get sort of the desired thickness that you want out of your eggnog. The more heavy cream, the thicker it's going to be, the less heavy cream, the less thick that it will be. And then some vanilla extract, which I have off to the side here. For this procedure, I also have a whisk. I don't know how easy that is to see on the screen, but I've got a whisk. I have a thermometer, so I can keep track of the temperature as I'm cooking the eggnog mixture. Now, you could have the eggnog raw, but we don't recommend that, and I'm going to teach how to cook it so it's safer to consume, but you could actually just mix these things together and put some booze in it and call it a day if you wanted to. Uh, but as a professional chef, I'm going to tell you that it's safer to cook it. I have a pot of water here. This pot of water is going to be my double boiler so that I don't mistakenly turn the eggnog into scrambled eggs. Oh, sorry. And if you don't have a double boiler, you can actually make this in a pot without water, but be careful. It could turn into scrambled eggs pretty quickly. I'm only going to watch the eggnog and make the truffles tonight. Okay, very cool. <laughs> All right, so that covers what will become our eggnog. And then, Chad, we have an array of alcohols we have to yep. switch the camera oh yes yep. right here there we go there we are so we have an array of alcohols that chad can speak on as far as flavors that we can impart into uh what eventually will become our eggnog personally i prefer a nice dark rum um, but it would also be common to find bourbon as well as a few different other things that are really cool that uh chad mentioned to me speaking of talented chad's talented too <laughs> He's not nearly as much as chef Cool. Now for the truffles, we're going to be creating a ganache. Now, I think that's probably the most surprising thing is that a truffle is a ganache, but instead of while it's hot liquid pouring it over something like say a Boston cream pie or over the top of an Enimo bar um, and letting it solidify, what we're going to do is let it get pretty close to getting solid and then roll it into a ball. And then you can just eat it, which will probably end up happening. No judgment. Or if you have some patience, toss it in some cocoa powder. So for the ganache, I have 250 grams of dark chocolate. And the nicer the chocolate, the better this is going to taste. So this is a really good opportunity to maybe splurge a little bit and get some really good chocolate. Exactly, Wendy. So much you can do with ganache. And it's a fancy term, too. So you can proudly say that you made a ganache. And then people are like, ooh, what? I have 115 grams of heavy cream. And again, the heavier the cream, the better it's going to taste. I think I've got 33%, but I mean, the higher you can go, the better it's going to be. I know butter's a bit of a pinch right now, uh, so you can always use margarine if you want to. Uh, but I have butter for this purpose. I have 30 grams of butter. And then the cocoa powder is kind of like just an as needed. However many truffles you make, because you can choose the size of them, which is also cool when you make it yourself. I have a prescribed size in here of about 
a two teaspoon ish size ball, which sure I might go bigger than that. Who knows? Um, but I've got roughly about a cup of cocoa powder and I have it in just a pie tin so that I can put the truffles in there. We can roll it around and then you're done. It'll be cool. And then I also have some gloves so I don't get my hands all chocolatey. Is there anything else that I have that you might want to have at the ready? Uh, I have whole nutmeg to garnish the cocktail when we're done. So I have a zester for the whole nutmeg. Again, you don't even need to garnish it however you want to do it. Uh, I have both a piping bag for the truffles and just a spoon for the truffles. The way we teach it at the culinary school is to put the ganache into a piping bag. You pipe out your size and then roll it. In all sincerity, you could just get a spoon and just and then roll it and call it a day. Uh, for the meringue, I do have a mixing bowl and a stand mixer, but that's up to you. If you want to turn it into a meringue, I'll walk you through that process. But if you don't, don't worry about it. Are there any questions about ingredients or setup? I do mean, just want to double check. Chef, you had said too, it's a good idea to have this all together. So, because once we get going, you're going to be correct going. Colette, you most certainly can use a cookie scoop for the ganache. And depending on the size of the cookie scoop will dictate the size of your uh, truffle. So a, the smaller the cookie scoop, I think would be the better, unless you want like a golf ball sized truffle, which I don't know that there's a problem with that. I was going to say, I wouldn't say no. Yeah, I don't think there's a problem with that. Um, and then, yes, we'll go over the process really quick because this isn't difficult, but once we get going on some of these things, we have to keep moving. Primarily, when we start getting on the eggnog, that's like a shuttle launch. The only thing you do in the shuttle launch is you find the direction up and then go. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to find the direction to heaven and we're going to get to Flavortown, but we have to go once that's going. But what I think we'll do first is make the ganache. Because once we make the ganache, we have to let it come down to temperature so that we can mold it into a truffle. While that's done and coming down to temperature, we'll turn our attention over to the eggnog. Basically, what we're going to do is make a creme anglaise. If you've ever heard of a creme anglaise before, this is it. So if you wanted to, you could take this exact recipe and just turn it into ice cream. You could do anything you want to do with a creme anglaise. But what we're going to do is make it a little bit thicker so that you can add some rum to it and then it thins it out and then you have a happy holiday. And then we're going to cool this down. And once this is cooled down, we'll mold our truffles. And then Chad will come in and talk about booze and we'll get the eggnog all boozed up. And we'll have a party. And if all that goes to plan, then great. And if not, we're all here together and we're going to figure it out. Never too much chocolate. That's very true. Do you ever use transfers to decorate the truffles? You totally could use transfers to decorate the truffles. Um, and that's, for example, where one of the things that we do here at Nate is we'll create chocolates. So you take a mold that's designed to have a filling in it, melt the chocolate, temper the chocolate so the cocoa butter is the right consistency, put it into the molds, kick the molds out, let it harden, take the same ganache mixture, any ganache mixture, it could be a passion fruit ganache, pipe it in there, and then do the same thing with the chocolate. And then let it harden, kick it out, and you have chocolate-covered um, truffles, basically. Yeah, that's what it is, chocolate-covered truffle. Um, but what you could do is before that, you can paint the inside of the mold. You can put a transfer on it. There's so many cool things that you can do with chocolate and with truffles. I'm going to start getting set up. Please, anybody let me know that we, if we have any questions, but I've got a pot. I have my 115 grams of heavy cream that has a quarter teaspoon of vanilla extract in it. I'm going to heat this up. Once it gets hot, 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 I'm going to pour it on top of my chocolate. And we're going to let the chocolate and the, the cream melt together. I'm going to stir it up. I've got a, a spatula here with me where I'm going to stir it up. Add in the butter, stir, 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 make sure it's homogenous. And then I'm going to leave it off to the side so it can come down to temperature, in which case, We'll then start getting ready on our eggnog. Cool.
And how is everybody doing? Is everybody ready for Christmas? Did anybody get any seven and a half foot tall Christmas trees? I was listening to the radio on the way to work the other day and a DJ was talking about getting a seven and a half foot tall Christmas tree for $750. And then the other DJ said, is that the same tree I got earlier in the year for like 350? And then they got into an argument about, you know, Christmas sales and things. And then I've got my recipe next to me, so I'm going to check off the steps. First step, heat the cream and vanilla to a simmer. I'm going to check that off because that's what I'm doing right now. And then the next step is pour over the, it says chopped chocolate. Now that's going to depend on the kind of chocolate that you have if your chocolate was whole. I have a seven and a half foot tree up. Beautiful. Thank you, Chance. Nice and bright and super Christmassy. Whoa. All right. That was more than a simmer. That was a boil. So I'm going to go ahead and pour it over top. That moved nice and quick, which was nice, nice, nice. And the trick here is to just let it do its thing. Now, as I was in the middle of mentioning, my chocolate's already in like a chip form, so I'm not going to worry about chopping it. But if you had like, say, Baker's chocolate or something, um, something that, you know, is in larger pieces, then you'll want to get that chopped up. Okay, so pour over the chopped chocolate in a bowl. Done. Stir until the chocolate is completely melted and blended in. Cool the mixture until just slightly warm to the touch. Stir in the butter until it is melted and completely blended in. Very cool. So what I'm going to do also at the same time that this is melting, melty schmelty, is I'm going to go ahead and start to get my milk and cream, what we'll refer to as scalded, same pot. Work on getting this guy scalded. Now I'm going to turn my temperature down because that, that happened fast. These induction burners are crazy. They go from zero to hero pretty quickly. Okay. <clears throat> now we're going to start to juggle a bit because I've got two things going on. <clears throat> While the chocolate is getting melty schmelty. Right here, I've got it melty schmelty. I'm also going to start to get this whole milk and heavy cream up to a scald, which means that the outer edges of the pot are bubbling. And what that's gonna do is number one, for the authors who, who wrote the recipe, just in case what you have is not pasteurized, we're pasteurizing it. But also what we're doing is we're gonna start to um, speed up the process. So while we're doing that, I'm going to combine the egg yolks and the sugar in a stainless steel bowl. So I've got my egg yolks here, and I've got my sugar, just like that. I'm going to go ahead and mix them together with my whisk. And if you've ever made brownies, this step should look fairly familiar. Get it nice and combined. Don't need to go too terribly crazy with it. I think it says until thick and light. Some recipes are kind of uh, cryptic. What does thick and light mean? You don't need to go too crazy. We're not trying to incorporate air. We're just trying to make sure that the egg yolks are broken up and that the sugar is incorporated. Now that's done. I've got my milk and heavy cream over here coming up two temperatures so I can start to get this moving because our eventual goal can you use a mixer for that eggs and sugar yes you can so long as you're able to get your mixing bowl back over to the double boiler so that you can 
cook up your egg mixture. And we're looking, once we do that, we're looking for 84 degrees Celsius or so for our egg mixture, because we're looking for the egg yolks. This is getting into technical stuff, but we're looking for the egg yolks and the proteins in them to start to activate, but just before they become scrambled eggs. Just before. Just before. And that will help to thicken it up. Cool. I'm going to take a look at my ganache here. Give my milk a stir. Let's take a look at my ganache. And I'm going to stir, and we can see the chocolate is fully melted. And I'm stir, 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 so that we can combine this. It's a nice consistency now. Yeah. And don't be afraid to really, 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 to make sure it's all nice and melty schmelty. And if it does end up solidifying a little too much, it's not the end of the world. We can just put it in the microwave for a few seconds. You've already got a double boiler set up. If you do, you can always put it into the water for a few seconds. But we're making sure that all of the chocolate is dissolved into the cream. I'm going to bring this a little bit closer if I can. Are you able to move the camera a bit, Chad? Uh, I can do that. Can you recommend a good quality chocolate? Nishimoto, that's a very good question. The chocolate that we are using is called Calibo. It is a Belgian chocolate, and I do recommend that. Uh, Calibo also has a brand not uh, similar to the store in Calgary, although I don't think they're allowed to call themselves Cocoa Berry anymore. Yeah, it's, there's legal issues. But I think there was a few legal issues with, uh, with that because Cocoa Berry out of Belgium came first. But Cocoa Berry or Calibo, if you can find those, I certainly recommend those. And that is currently what we are using here. And I'm just looking to make sure that everything is dissolved in. In which case, mine actually isn't. I didn't have enough heat. And this is good because it shows that, guess what? Sometimes chefs have issues too. But it's not about having the issue. It's about how we solve the issue. Okay, this milk is starting to scald. I'm going to set my ganache over to the side for a second. And because my milk is starting to scald, I'm going to go ahead and change out. It also is a little bit colder in this room than it probably is in your house right now. And I also have marble next to me that's very cold. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my hot milk and I'm going to pour some in. And mix it in with the egg yolks. And what this is referred to as is tempering the egg yolks. And while I'm tempering in the egg yolks, I'm also getting my water up to speed here. So that we can start to create the double boiler. Now, if you're not using a double boiler, then <clears throat> temper the egg yolks. And on a low heat, just make sure you're not turning anything into scrambled eggs. There we go. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and put in the rest of the milk. And I'm done with this pot for now. Fully incorporate. So now we should have our whole milk heavy cream, white sugar, and egg yolks. And I currently have it set up in a double boiler. And what I'm going to do is continue to stir once our water gets going. And what I'm looking to do is make sure, because if it stays still at any point, it could turn into scrambled eggs, and we don't want that. So I'm going to keep it moving. I'm going to grab my thermometer. A laser thermometer will work just as fine as well if you have a laser thermometer. And if you don't have a thermometer at all, and you're just going by the, the beat of your heart, then good luck. What you're looking for is the mixture will change. 
And I know that sounds kind of vague, but there's two changes that are going to happen. The first change is it will like snap in place. And what a snap in place means is that once we hit about that 82 to 86 degrees Celsius, the egg yolks are going to change and it's going to sort of thicken a little bit and snap into place and it'll smell different, it'll behave different, it'll look different. The next stage after that is scrambled eggs. <laughs> I'm just checking my water, making sure we're getting up to speed. I'm gonna check my ganache while I'm waiting for the water to come up to speed. Yeah, I still got some lumpy schmumpy, so maybe my chips were too big. Story of my life, Chad. I'm walking around with chips on my shoulders that are too big. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just gonna go ahead and microwave it for a very small amount of time. We have to be careful with microwaves and chocolate because burnt chocolate is oh, not your friend. Burnt chocolate is not your friend, and burnt chocolate in the microwave is especially not your friend. Gonna check my double boiler. Okay, we're not boiling yet. That's fine. Okay, I'm doing 20 second bursts until I get there. Melty schmelty and lumpy schmumpy. I should have said corking courses when I was an eight. You're great. Well, thank you, Chance. Those are the technical terms, right? Those are, those are the official technical terms, yes. Well, you could say now is your chance. Get it? Now's your chance? Get it? We'll be here all week. We'll be here all week. Please don't forget to uh, tip our administrative assistant. She works hard. Yes. Cool. So that worked. A 20 second burst for me and my microwave worked. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in the butter, the butter. Nobody ever stutters over the butter. Stutter. Butter. Butter stutter. Butter. Butter stutter. What does the butter do? I don't know, Chad. It makes it taste good. Any other questions? I have not <laughs> found a time butter to not be the right choice. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Looking for this butter to melt in and incorporate. Multitasking. Fantastic. Did you go through the culinary program, Chance? Dun -dun -dun -dun. Dun -dun -dun -dun. I think I'm incorporated. Not like as a company, but like I think we're incorporated. Get it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Water's starting to get warm. I'm going to go give my hand a quick wipe because I have butter and chocolate on it, which I guess isn't the worst thing in the world. Looks like I saw some people taking some notes. Smart, smart students, Chad. There we go. Gorgeous. Where's my... Oh, yeah, gorgeous. See that nice shine? That shine actually comes from the butter. It comes from good, high-quality chocolate. I know we had a question about good chocolate. Oh, you took accounting. Well, if I had known that, I would have busted out some beans, Chance. <laughs> Boom, there we go. How is everybody doing? Is your ganache all ganached? Is it ganached yet? Let's take a look at our steps. I know we're jumping between a few things, but that's why we just want to make sure everyone has a chance to follow along. If you have any questions, get a little lost, that's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. Also, I kind of hope I'm demonstrating that, you know, yeah, it's important to keep this kind of thing moving, but you can see how nonchalant I'm being about it. Because I've done this so many times that I know that you kind of really have to screw up pretty hard to get scrambled eggs. It is a concern, but you've really got to screw up really hard. To, it's like crashing a Mac. How did you do that? I, I know people. <laughs> I know people. Oh, I know. My wife. My wife crashes a Mac. Are you kidding? My wife shut down a Mac the first time that she, she touched it. And the library that she was at had to actually like decommission the computer. 
So that's a good, that's a good start to that it, kind of relationship. It is. It is. Do you do stand up as well? Well, thank you, Wendy. Yeah, that's actually not the first time I've heard that. I don't know what I would say if they gave me a microphone, but I suppose I should give it a try one of these days. Just go to an open mic. Give him a guitar instead. He's yeah. Emily, he's standing up right now. You know, that is true. I'll have to call my wife and tell her, honey, I'm at work. Got to check in every now and again, you know? Okay, so my water is starting to boil. I don't know if you want to switch it over, Chad. Yep. Yeah. Chad's so mesmerized by everything that's going on. So my water is starting to boil, which is good. Oh, no, I got my paper wet. Which I guess people might be intrigued to see that a chef has a recipe, but that's... You just have more experience and repetition to notice the quality points, but you still want to make sure you're doing it right. Always have a recipe. I cannot stress that enough. Just because I'm a chef does not mean I don't use a recipe or I don't have a recipe. I'm always looking at recipes. The difference, I guess, between me and myself, me now and me before I knew recipes, before I went to culinary school, is I can look at a recipe and like the Terminator, I just start going... What are the ratios that I'm working with here? What kind of style of cooking is this? What am I looking to make? Did this person write the recipe wrong? Um, what are some of the key factors that I'm looking for, the quality points? Um, but always have a roadmap, always. And the roadmap is not exactly the territory, right? Yeah. So my ganache didn't melt the way the recipe said. Ugh. Now what do I do? Well, make it melt. Chad, you got to make it melt. Who's in control here? Me or the ganache? <laughs> Hopefully not the ganache, because it's just sitting there relaxing. I know. It's just sitting there. It's not doing anything. Cool. So I'm just giving it a nice little stir, checking my water. It's still boiling. We still have enough water. If for whatever reason, at any point in time, you start to smell burning metal, go ahead and check. Make sure you still have water in there. You don't need a lot of water. And it's preferable that your water doesn't touch the bowl. And then at some point, I should probably get this thing in here so I can see where I'm at. And we're starting to move. I am currently at 75 degrees Celsius. And like I said, I'm looking for about 84. 82 to 86 degrees Celsius. And I'm currently sitting at 77. So this is moving pretty quickly, and I'm pretty happy with that. Once this hits 88 miles an hour, I mean, once this hits 84 degrees Celsius, I'm going to take it off of the heat. I'm going to add in my vanilla, give it a good stir, and then I'm going to put it in the fridge. And we'll check on it every now and again, but I'm going to put it in the fridge so it can cool down. Uh-oh, my thermometer just changed on me. I don't want 164 degrees. What in the world's going on here? Thermometers these days. M. Skelton, which is the, probably the best author name I've ever heard. M. Skelton, if you have any books, please let me know. I would like to buy them. Uh, I have a distant relative that has made on-site chocolate shop in Ghent, Belgium, and is also a national chocolatier judge. Does that mean I have chocolate in my DNA? Yep. You also answer your own questions. I, I, I love the, the connection. Boom. Okay, so I'm at 84, and I, part of the reason I knew that is because it is, in fact, moving differently. I don't know if it's possible to see how it's moving differently. But it's got more resistance. It's got higher viscosity. Ugh. Ugh. I'm trying to take the saran wrap off of my vanilla. Oh, no. I'm just going to break it open. This is an emergency situation. we got to move. Boom. Okay. Emergency. Vanilla in. Stir. There we go. Boom. And into the fridge. Into the fridge it goes. Okay, that was the hardest part of the evening. It's all downhill from here. You could also put your bowl into an ice bath. I think it even recommends that in the recipe, that thing that I have next to me that I keep saying I should read, which is also possible. Okay, my temperature's off. I'm going to wipe my biotherm, my thermometer. Cool. So that's the base of our eggnog. And the base of our eggnog is creme anglaise. And a creme anglaise is a basic vanilla custard that 
has a wide array of uses. You could use, use it as a sauce, for example, with bread pudding, which is probably one of the more common uses for it. Uh, or as, oh man, there's so many things you can do with it in desserts. Uh, uh, it's also, ice cream is... You said it's the base of ice cream. So there are principally two different kinds of ice creams. There's creme anglaise, which would be known as French vanilla, meaning that it has egg yolks in it. You would just add a little bit more whipping cream to lighten it up and then put it into uh, an ice cream machine. Out comes ice cream. The other way to do it is the most common way. And this is more of like your Dairy Queen style of ice cream where there's no egg yolk in it at all. It's just milk and sugar. And there's enough sugar in it, like a lot of sugar, so that it then turns into ice cream while it churns. And the reason it's more common is because you can pump more air into it and legally you can pump twice the amount of air into ice cream. So if you've ever wondered why your ice cream when it melts goes all the way down, it's because you bought air. <laughs> yeah. And that's why we can make ice cream ourselves. Okay, Ganache, how are we doing? This is also gonna need some time. So I'm gonna put this into the fridge as well. So I've got two things going on in the fridge right now. I have my ganache so that we can actually turn it into truffles. And I have my creme anglaise so we can turn that into eggnog. In which case, this would be a good time for everybody to get caught up and ask any questions that you may have. And let's go over our steps while I'm waiting for any questions to come in. Okay, so for the ganache itself, or the truffles rather, we have heat the cream of vanilla to a simmer. Boom, done. Pour over the chopped chocolate in a bowl, which we did. Stir until the chocolate is completely melted and blended in. I did. Cool the mixture until it was just slightly warm to the touch. I kind of did that. Uh, stir in the butter until it is melted and completely blended in. Check, I did that. Let the mixture stand until it starts to thicken and then put it into a pastry bag. You don't have to, but that's what's recommended. Are those hats available somewhere? Yes. If you go to chefware.com, S, no, not S, S, C, H, C, right. Chef begins with C, C, H, E, F, W, A, R, E, or W, E, A, W, A, R, E. Wow. I should have rehearsed this before I answered it. I apologize. Uh, but chefware.com is a really good place where you can get uh, chef coats, chef pants, aprons, all kinds of stuff. I think they even have um, ingredients like chocolates and whatnot. How thick do we want the ganache before we start shaping? Uh, that's a good question, Emily. As long as you can basically take a spoon or something and be able to form a ball. If it looks more like a sauce or a pudding, it's not thick enough yet. But right about the point where you can start to form it into a ball, you're gold. Uh, what size eggs are you using? Great question, Colette. I am using large eggs, so therefore they are approximately 50 grams each egg. Chance, sweet, thank you. Tammy, chefware.com. Thank you so much, Tammy. You are, you saved me. I was starting to question my own career choices for a second there, and you saved me, so thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, what do we got? Yeah, so let the mixture stand until it starts to thicken. Place the mixture into, or sorry, yeah. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Put it into a pastry bag. I do have a pastry bag. I'll be honest, it's my least favorite one to do. You are awesome. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, let the mixture stand until it starts to thicken and then put it into a pastry bag. So that's what we recommend at the school. That's probably what a professional would do out in the industry, um, in the truffle making industry, which is probably just the toughest job in the world. You just, you know, stand ankle cuffed to a table and have to make a thousand truffles a day. Horrible. Uh, pipe it into small mounds, about two teaspoons each on sheets of parchment paper, and then chill until firm. Yeah. Or the other option is kind of what I'm doing now, chilling what I have. And then we can just take a spoon and just roll a couple just to demonstrate. And then, you know, you can go to town or just eat it. If you've just started eating your ganache, I won't judge. Okay, and yeah, wearing disposable gloves one by one, roll the mounds, we'll get there. And then put them into cocoa, which is my current recommendation. It's the easiest one, and it looks fancy schmancy. Um, but again, you could do anything. So like, some people had some other cool um, ideas. 
Looking at my game plan, truffle ganache, done. Creme anglaise, done. Currently cooling the creme anglaise and currently cooling the truffle ganache. So combine the egg yolks of sugar and stainless steel bowl, whip, we did. Scald the milk, we did. Temper the eggs, we did. Heat it up to 82, I actually got mine up to 84. Immediately remove and cool, and then comes the next part. So. While I'm waiting, actually, one of the things I can do is I can show you guys how to make a meringue with the egg whites. And then we can have that set off to the side because we can then take that and incorporate it into the eggnog mixture. So let's go ahead and do that. And at its core, a meringue is the egg whites, no fat whatsoever. There cannot be any fat. So make sure the bowl is clean, like squeaky, squeaky clean, like <clears throat> squeaky clean. There cannot be any traces of fat anywhere. No traces of fat in the bowl, no traces of fat on the whisk. If any egg yolk got into the egg whites, I'm sorry, not going to work. Um, the, any amount of fat will prevent the egg whites from taking air on and becoming meringue. Sometimes I get way too nervous about meringue. Let me tell you something. The other day, actually, we were doing something. Yeah, we were cooking yep. Japanese street food for the Board of Governors for Nate. And they came in and I immediately was like, Ugh. and one of them asked like, which is the, the hardest part here? You've got rice, you've got chicken, you've got sauce, you know, you've got all this stuff. What's the hardest part? And I said, the rice. He's like, really, the rice? Yeah, and now that you're all here, I gotta make sure that you have something to eat. It's like, there's a little bit of nervousness that kind of never goes away, even though I'm capable and I know I can do it. There's still that little bit of nervousness that never goes away. That like, I'm my function in life is to make sure that you have a transcendent experience through the power of food. If I don't deliver, Chad, you do great. Ugh. You can't say I didn't because. Chad's been to Japan and he tried my street food and I've never been to Japan. It was pretty tasty. I, I felt it. Chad, Chad had a moment. I felt it. There wasn't much left after. Well, no. And then I had two students who were helping me and I let them know like, Hey, you should give samples to other people. And they were like, what samples? <laughs> pretty much. But I'm glad it turned out, especially as somebody who's never been to Japan and never tried it. I'm just basing it off of a recipe. Boss mission statement, sir. Thanks, Chance. Okay, so I've got my egg whites that are sans fat, at least in the egg whites. We'll find out if I have fat in the bowl in a second, I guess. But I've washed it. I've made sure we're good as best as I can. Whenever I make angel food cake at home, which requires making meringue and then adding flour to it, so... If you didn't know, Angel Food Cake is the only fat-free cake on the planet, which um, I guess makes it healthy, right? We'll go with that. Yeah, we'll go with that. But just like with the ice cream, when I said that because there's no egg yolk, they need more sugar to turn it into ice cream, in order to get Angel Food Cake, you need way more sugar than you would with a cake that has fat in it. Trade-off. So you know what they say, you can have your cake and I hope you eat it. Why else did you buy it? That was uh, Marie Antoinette, right? That's, yeah. That's, that's the official line? Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to check on my eggnog mixture and stir it up. Because what's going to happen here is the top's going to get cold. i got to stir it in. So I'm going to put it back in the fridge. Check on my ganache. Still a little too loose. And that's okay. I'm going to stir it. Too loose. Looks kind of like more like a sauce. Stirred it in back in the back in the fridge. Okay, meringue time. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna pop it into the mixer. And if you're gonna do this by hand, then just uh, you know find your elbow grease and just boop, 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 boop. But what you're gonna do? Grab some sugar. So I've got the egg whites in my mixing bowl and I've got the whisk attachment and then I have some sugar here. I 
And you don't really need sugar for meringue. It does help. You can also add a, an acid to it as well, such as cream of tartar. But we're really not looking to maintain the meringue. We're just turning it into meringue to incorporate some air and some sugar so that the egg whites can take on that sugar. And then we'll incorporate it back in about a tablespoon of sugar. You can see my accurate measurements here using a regular old spoon. Don't you love it on cooking shows when they do that? They're like, yeah, we're just going to do like a tablespoon of olive oil. And it's like measured very officially. Yeah. yeah. You're like, right, buddy. That was a tablespoon. Okay, I'm gonna kick it on. I'm trying to do this backwards. I'm doing it for you guys. Sacrifices that I make, Chad. Locked and loaded. Locked and loaded. Oh, after all that, I can't even get my whisk in. <laughs> all right. There you go. We did it. Okay, so what I'm looking to do is make sure that it's going to whip. And we'll be able to tell pretty quickly. If it starts to froth, we're going to get there. If it just kind of swishes around in the bowl, it means I've got too much fat. And that means i got to start over. Or I just, my eggnog won't have any egg, egg whites in it. Now, it's not entirely a waste if you find that your egg whites have fat in them. Well, then just incorporate some eggs, make some scrambled eggs, egg white frittata, egg white omelet, you know, whatever. Then once we start getting some substantial froth, I'm going to start to kick in my tablespoon of sugar. And then once we get to meringue, I just stop. Because if I don't stop, it'll start to break down and it'll become too stiff. Oh, fun fact, while we're here, the faster you go, the faster it will turn into meringue. However, larger gulps of air are going in, so therefore the air bubbles that are being trapped in the egg whites are bigger, meaning that if you pop one, you lose a substantial amount. So I'm actually gonna go a little bit lower so that I trap more tinier air bubbles so that it's a stronger meringue. Same thing goes for whipped cream. I'm learning. Learning. Why don't you add the sugar before starting to whip the egg whites? That's a really good question, Colette. I don't immediately know the answer to that. We will take a look and see what we can find out for you. Yeah, I'll have to check my textbook. At this point, I just remember what I'm supposed to do, not necessarily why I'm supposed to do it. And I apologize if that wasn't the answer you were looking for. But I figure honesty is the best policy. <laughs> In case we need to turn them into scrambled eggs, yeah. Okay, I'm starting to get some bubbles, which is a promising sign. Up, up, up. Yeah, there are three different kinds of meringue that we learn about. Simple meringue, which is what we're doing here. You add the sugar in after you get bubbles. There's Swiss meringue, which you actually add the sugar and the eggs at the same time, bring both up to a particular temperature, which I'd have to consult, and then whip it into meringue, uh, which is more stable and safer because you're trying to pasteurize the egg whites. And then there's the most stable, which is called Italian meringue, where you make a sugar syrup that you heat up to, I think like 110 Celsius, you get your egg whites going, and then when they start to bubble, you pour in the sugar syrup, and then it turns into a really nice shiny meringue. Chad, do you have an answer? Yeah, so this is actually from the America's Test Kitchen. Okay. Um, so adding the sugar after a brief amount of whipping gives the protein network time to form while leaving enough time for the sugar to dissolve. Ooh. Yeah. It's uh, to give you ideal volume and stability. Okay, cool. Colette, does that answer work? America's Test Kitchen, all the way back from the year 2000. 
one of the most successful TV programs ever, actually, in food media history. No problem, Pat. What I'm doing now is just checking to see if I'm going fast enough. I don't want to go crazy. I could go crazy. It'll happen really fast. But like I said, part of that protein network involves the amount of air that's coming in and what's being trapped. And if I have too big of air bubbles, yeah, we'll get there really fast, but it's not as stable. Now I'm going to start to put in my sugar. This would also be the time to add in anything else you might want, such as that cream of tartar, which will help with stability some salt, which will help with flavor, as well as salt actually toughens proteins. Egg whites, protein, tough, tough. And now we're on our way to Meringue City, which I think was in SpongeBob, right? Meringue City? Probably. Probably. Gonna bring my cocoa powder out. Cocoa powder, cocoa powder. Same thing goes for cocoa powder too. Um, cocoa powder ranges from really cheap and kind of unflavorful and lacking in vitamins and minerals and the things that the cacao plant has naturally, um, all the way up to more expensive cocoa powder that isn't as denatured and has more oomph to it. And I know it kind of seems like it could be a bit expensive, like a $5 thing of cocoa versus a $15 thing of cocoa. But as often as, at least in my house, we're baking a cake with a tablespoon of it, we're making some hot chocolate every now and again, it's kind of worth it. And especially if we're going to make hot chocolate, we're starting to get magnesium and zinc and a few other things that might not be in the cheaper cocoa and really good flavor. Okay, getting there. Still a little loose. And then once we're done here, I'll bring Chad on so that he can start talking about the different alcohols and then start getting the eggnog ready to rock and roll. That sound fair? That sounds great. Okay. And like, I could go faster, but why? Enjoy the process. Yeah, and the company that we have, such as you find people. And I can also start to use this as like a quote unquote teaching moment, even though I'm teaching and it's a moment, is, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I have to turn this restaurant and right around. We're definitely not there yet. You can see that it's not forming any kind of a peak yet. And in meringue, we have different terms, soft peaks and firm peaks. We are currently at no peaks. The honest truth, John, is it looks a little bit like um, dish soap that's gotten really foamy. Yeah. At this point. Yeah. And that's fair. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back on. I'm going to give my uh, creme on glaze and my ganache a stir down in the fridge and then um, check it again. Oh. Oh, 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 we're getting there, Chad. Getting there. Yeah, and the key is that the sides are starting to get cooler than the center, so we're stirring it to make sure that we can thermalize the entire, thermalize the core. Oh, sorry. So I'm going to switch the cameras here and I'll zoom in a little bit, Chef, just sure. to see if we can get an idea of like some of the texture. You can see that it's still a little runny. Yeah, still a little runny. That's okay.
But you can see there's actually some chunks that are starting to form. Yeah, some solidification, but not there yeah. quite. Correct. Good food takes time. But at the very least, we're getting everybody here into the ballpark, right? Yep. Oh, exactly. looks like we're getting there. Okay. Uh. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Almost. More bubbly, but not quite there yet. Is anybody else turning their egg whites into meringue? How's it going for everybody? Again, this is optional, so don't don't feel like you have to. It's just we're really good on making sure we reduce our our food waste and we want to use up everything. Yeah. I usually put ours into a baking dish and it solidifies quicker. Well, Wendy, aren't you just <laughs> smart? That's the good But yes, you're increasing increasing your surface area. So therefore it uh yeah. That sounds like a really smart idea. Maybe I should do that. Do you want me to... I should consult for... Wendy more often with almost anything in my life, apparently. Do you want me to look for anything for you, Chef? Or... Sure. Yeah, just a half... Not a half-sheet tray, but like uh, a shallow half insert. Okay, I will go take a look. I'm just going to mute myself, and I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops, wrong direction. I know, right, Wendy? Who hired this guy? Jeez. There we go. Oh, yeah. Let's check this meringue now. Oop. Oop. We're probably there. Yeah. It's a peak. So I was going to focus there. That's looking nice. We have made the peaks. Cool. So that we can incorporate back into our eggnog. While I also use Wendy's amazing idea, I will leave my contact info in the chat. Thank you so much, Wendy. It'll be our little secret, Wendy. Nobody has to know that I didn't know what I was doing and that you came in and saved the day. Pay no attention behind the curtain. Yes. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and check my creme anglaise and see if it's at a place where we can do our thing. Yeah. So let's grab our uh -huh. egg whites. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Would you look at that, Chad? Would you look at that? Oh, look oh, at that's that. That's looking great. Oh, look at that. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anybody else get excited about food, or is it just me? I guess it was a good career choice. Food, food is a generally a good, a good thing. Yeah. You know what's funny is how many times I'm like, I'm not passionate about food, and then my, like, the record goes like, Ooh! and my wife is like, Are you are you sure you're not passionate about food? You, you're positive. This is my only spatula, Chad. So the only spatula. My only spatula. So I'm going to clean it off. Yep. So I can incorporate the uh, egg whites. Ooh, that looks good. That's coming along really quite nice. So I figure what will happen is I'll incorporate the egg whites. You'll come over talk about these things over here and how we can turn this into a cocktail, and then we'll. Form the truffles. Cool. Form the truffles. Form the truffles.
All gate. Let's roll. Let me set my whisk over here for a second. I saved the day again. All right, I'll let it get to your head, Wendy. Oh, yeah. Now, normally you would want to fold this particular product in, and you could. But uh, I think the intention is for you to be able to drink it, so I don't really know how much I care about delicately folding it in at the moment. Incorporating is... In, yeah, yeah. Because if we were making, like, an angel food cake, for example, then, yeah, of course, you got to make sure that you're, you know, gently folding it in. You don't want to destroy all that air that you just built up. But we're trying to make a drink here. Um, chef, if I may, uh, Alice has a very good question in chat there. Yeah. Can you overchill the truffles? Yeah, that's a good question. You, of course, can overchill the truffles, in which case it'll be too hard to work because there's chocolate and butter in it. And what happens when butter gets cold? It gets really solid. So just microwave it for a little bit, 10, 20 seconds until it's soft enough. And you may have to play a game, a little game where you go, oh, I made it too hot. Cool it down. Oh, I made it too cold. Oh, I made it too hot. But eventually you'll get there. The Goldilocks phenomena. Exactly. Trust me. That uh, happens to all of us. Okay. And then the cool thing is that, you know, as you do this, you can start to think, do I want eggnog like this? Do I not want eggnog like this? Maybe I'll incorporate fewer egg whites next time. Maybe I won't incorporate any egg whites next time. This is entirely up to you. This is just a, a basic benchmark for making stuff. And then each year, you can become known as the person who shows up to your holiday get-together with eggnog and truffles, but everybody knows that you made it and you've been working on it for, you know, the last hour, and it's, like, perfect, right? That now, this is a little too fluffy for me, personally, so I'm just going to kill some of the air so I can get a drink back. As opposed to a smoothie. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Okay, so Chad, why don't you go ahead and come in and talk about alcohol? I'm going to go ahead and put this back into the fridge for now. Perfect. And then when you're ready, we can go ahead and put it into glasses and such. Perfect. So, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chad Cooper. I'm one of the maitre d's here at Ernest Dining Room at Mate. Um, so, the booze and cocktails are definitely more in my wheelhouse. So, uh, I really appreciate Chef John being able to show you everything else because I can't do that. Um, so, um, just some eggnog facts. Uh, so eggnog is basically just as chef has prepared for you here. Um, it's the technical terms when you actually get into adding alcohol into it, it becomes milk punch or egg milk punch, but we just usually call it eggnog because yeah, why not? Um, so generally as the basis, you're going to want to have a distilled spirit. Um, you're looking usually around that 40% alcohol, 80 proof. Uh, so as Chef mentioned, in, down in the southern states, they use a lot of bourbon. Um, other ones, you can have... So I changed the camera angle for you, Chad. It's currently from above. Oh, currently from above. I apologize. Uh, go to... Actually, no, it should be on one right now. You're on the right camera right now. You're oh, seeing with the other feed that they can't see. Oh, right okay, cool. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> no worries. Um, so going with a nice dark rum uh, is great. Classic spice rum. A lot of people know. I know Chef John and I, uh, when we were testing this, we added in a little bit of spice rum, brings out everything's classic. But you can play around with it a lot too, based on what your preferences are and what you enjoy, what you have at home. Um, you know, the rum is great. I, I know that's a, a standard we have all over. I love brandy or cognac as well. It has that nice, rich, smooth flavor to it. Um, additionally, scotch isn't out of the, the picture, but it would be you want to use specific types, not going into it too much. Avoid Islay scotches because they're basically going to take like taste like a bonfire of peat. Um, go with like a lowland scotch or a certain types of highland scotch are very nice, smooth, caramel notes, buttery, creamy. It was great. Um, but then there's other things you can do. You can play around with it. You can add in other liquors. So we were thinking about different styles you can do. Um, classic hazelnut. Add some frangelico or other hazelnut liqueur. I've also found pistachio liqueurs out there, which are quite nice. 
Mm -hmm. um, you can throw in some amaretto, bring out that almond. Um, those are nice warm flavors, but we also thought, you know, you can play around with a little bit too. So you can do like a chocolate orange. You can do um, like triple sec, curacao, sorry, triple sec, Cointreau or Grand Marnier, all orange liqueurs. You can throw in then some creme de cacao. So that's going to be your chocolate flavoring. So you've got that orange. If anyone likes to whack to unwrap the Terry's chocolate orange, that's where you're going to get with that. Um, so alcohol you, substitutes. Alcohol substitutes. This is actually a really good one. Uh, I talked to a couple people around. When you're going for rum, one of the biggest flavors with rum, obviously, is that cane sugar flavor. So if you have a sugar in the raw, uh, brown sugar might not be as good, but like a raw sugar would be great. You're going to do a two to one syrup. Most simple syrup is one to one sugar and water. This one, we're going to want that richer, deeper notes. So you're going to do two times of the raw sugar to one of water. I'd weigh it out. Best way to do it. Um, and then you're just going to slowly boil that down, melt it down a little bit, stir it. Once it's all dissolved, you now have a extra rich sh sugar syrup. And you add that in, and it's going to give you those cane flavor notes that you would be missing from uh, you know, rum. Um, and also those caramel notes would be really good with that. Um, there, that way, you don't have to make it alcoholic. And you know, with the way the roads are today, I wouldn't encourage anyone to be having any alcohol and going out on the roads. But you still want to visit, so that's a nice thing. Mm -hmm. um, this drink has been enjoyed for a very long time. Um, the first time egg or nog was used is around like 1700, a little before. And uh, if anyone's interested, there is George Washington's eggnog recipe. It is not for the faint of heart or sober. Um, it's one quart cream, one quart milk, 12 tablespoons sugar, and then one pint of brandy, half a pint of rye, half a pint of Jamaican rum, a quarter pint of sherry. A sherry is another uh, one or... Um, you know, fortified wines fortified. can be a great one. Um, and it's, it's a lot of booze in that one. I think you can light it on fire. Probably good. Maybe it was, didn't he not have teeth? Uh, they were wooden or something like that. Or yeah, that's how you keep your wooden teeth fresh. Is that much sherry? Keeps anything from growing. George, George, George. Exactly. So it's that it's out on the internet. If anyone wants to look for George Washington's recipe, but that is a, uh, potent drink with that yeah. but really you know you can add in those different flavors you want to play with um the classic basically what makes eggnog is you're gonna have vanilla cinnamon nutmeg play around with it as we were talking about you know authenticity before we started uh doing this Jeff john had a great conversation about that you know it might you might not call it uh, a milk punch or eggnog in the traditional sense but if you've mixed it and the flavors are to your liking mm -hmm. it doesn't matter you just might get an argument on the internet if someone Call you, we'll call it egg. <laughs> well, you know, a quality way to spend your evening, I think, is getting into long, raptured arguments with people on the internet. But if there's anything that we did find that I thought was really quite surprising was that trying to define eggnog because it's such an old beverage is actually really quite difficult. So I think better is, well, how does it exist right now in 2022, almost 2023? And this is going to get you definitely into the ballpark. Um, my wife didn't want to try it. She hates eggnog. I'm kind of indifferent. I tried it and I was like, yeah, that's eggnog. I'm not going to go crazy for it or anything, but I don't hate it. It's just like, all right, that's eggnog. I think it's my like yearly family tradition. And December 24th is National Eggnog Day. Mm -hmm. So it's not a bad time to go about having it, but it's, it's like that nice thing to appreciate um, yeah, every once in a while. But if you really like it, go for it. Sure. Cool. So what I'm going to do really quick, I'm going to answer a couple of questions that came up. I'm going to get you the base. Go ahead and mix it up and dress it up. And then we have a whole piece of nutmeg and something I can use to shave it so it looks fancy. Um, cool. Look tasty. Yeah. How long does eggnog last? As long as it's delicious, it shouldn't last long is my chef answer. Um, my official Alberta Health Services food inspector answer is seven days. Uh, but it is real. So do know that it is real. And because of the egg content that's in it, even though we took it up to a particular temperature, it still is considered 
dangerous as far as food is concerned. And I don't want to alarm you. It's just from a sanitation perspective, some foods are more dangerous than others as far as harboring bacteria is concerned. Lasagna, for example, is one of them. And it's like, leave lasagna out of this, man. Like, get away. Why are you saying calling lasagna dangerous? Dangerously good. But it's because of all the layers that steam can't escape as quickly. So therefore, there's a chance that if it's not cooled down properly, it could harbor bacteria. Ice cream because of the egg because of the egg content. And this is technically a custard, uh, can fall into that. So make sure that as we're making it, we're respecting the sanitation rules. Like I said in the beginning, you could consume it raw, especially with the alcohol, you're taming a lot of the bacteria, but we're cooking it up to help maintain that. I'm cooling it down as quickly as I can, making sure the alcohol gets in there quickly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but my official Alberta Health Services food inspector answer is seven days from the date of creation. If I went into a restaurant right now and I found a salad dressing or anything that was dated beyond seven days, it should be chucked. It should be thrown out. Is that is that like a magic thing? Does that mean it actually has gone bad? No, but that's what we do for food inspection in restaurants. Uh, what else is there, Wendy? With many, uh, no, sorry, Cindy, with many types of eggs, free run, organic, cheap, who knows how they are raised, et cetera. Questionable practices. Uh, is there a preferred egg for a nog? Not sure if it matters. I think, Cindy, that matters more to you than it matters to the eggnog to a degree. Um, if anybody's ever been on a farm and had a farm fresh egg and then been back to the city with we city yokels or something, city folk, I think it's the yokels on the farm and we're the city folk. But anyway, nevertheless. There's a difference. There are people who have an egg allergy and then they go onto a farm and they have a real egg and they're like, that's weird because there's some differences. So if you feel there's a difference in the taste of the egg, then it will make a difference in the eggnog. It'll make a difference in everything that you do. It'll make a difference in your pancakes. So that's the simple answer, Cindy, on that one. If it doesn't make a difference. If you can taste a difference, it makes a difference. If you can taste a difference in any ingredient that you're putting into something, then it will make a difference. Cool. All right, Chad. Come over here. Time to nogify. Yeah. Time to nogify. So I've got a ladle. Okay. Here's our eggnog. Currently, it's really quite thick, really quite frothy. It will settle over time. And that frothiness or that thickness kind of depends on, you know, if you like to, let's say, thin out your eggnog quite a bit, you might want to make it thicker. Or if you're in the case of, I think it was, thanks, Wendy. I believe it was Wendy said, hey, I'm not going to put alcohol in mine. So you won't be thinning yours out. Then, you know, maybe use less cream, more milk. This is where you can really start to play with those ratios. Oh, and this, it's up to your preference, too, with what you like. Yep. And... yep. Is anybody surprised that this is how eggnog is made? Is anybody like, what? Are you kidding me? It's eggs and cream. That's disgusting. I know, right? It's delicious. I mean, yeah, it's delicious. All right. Now, I'm actually thinking about this process as I'm doing it here a little bit. So sure. I just have a nice rocks glass, whatever size that you really want. Um, generally, we'll use our jiggers, measure, Basically, just keeping it consistent is the best thing. You don't have to do that if you just want to free pour. Up to you. Uh, I'm going to be putting one ounce in here total. Um, so I have a large two ounce and a one ounce. Let's see what we're going to do. I'm going to do. I want to do some brandy. Brandy? Sure. Well, and the, uh, why, why don't I do brandy and I'll make you one with rum? Thank you. And the sailors say brandy. <laughs> what a good one. What a good so one. generally with the, the distilled spirits, the 40%, um, I'm generally going to use that as my main ingredient. So with this, I'm probably going to do 0.75 ounces of the brandy and I'll do, I'm trying to think, I think I'm going to do some frangelico, some hazelnut. I'm going to do 0.25 ounces of that. Uh, it just, uh, you can play around with those ratios for your preference and how you like things to come out. My ganache went too far. I think somebody asked a question about this. Uh, yeah, I might have to soften that. Elbow grease. That's currently what I'm using. I don't think that's what I said, though. I think my official answer was to play back and forth. Yeah, heat it up. Was expecting meringue to be a part of eggnog. Yeah, and it, you know that's optional. It doesn't have to be. No, that's a, a great way. Mm -hmm. 
So I put 0.75 ounce in here. I'm just gonna quickly grab something out of the way here. While Chad's doing that, I'm, I've got some, some ganache here. I'm just gonna roll it into a ball. And then I'm gonna feed it to my chef who's over here. Chef, do you want a truffle? That smells good. Okay. Thankfully, my chef says he wants a truffle. And this is the guy who hired me, so it had better be good. We can make it bigger. We can make it bigger. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely not a two teaspoon sized guy, but. Thank you. You are welcome. Oops, sorry. It's fresh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. He says it's good. So I'm just going to give this a quick stir. I just have my bar spoon here. Any spoon will work. This was just convenient. Um, and the reason I put the alcohol in first, or if you're doing uh, like a, a version one with um, your simple syrup or your, I guess, raw <laughs> sugar. Got a piece of truffle on the bowl, trying to be a stowaway. <laughs> Help me. Not on our watch, Chad. Um, you'd want to put it in first, and the reason is just the extra little bit of force as you're pouring it in is going to help mix it in. We're still going to stir it a little bit, but just helps to incorporate everything a little bit better. I just tried a little truffle, and it's good. And going back to the chocolate thing, really good chocolate has terroir or terroir in it like wine does, or like really good coffee. If you've never experienced really good coffee. Um, just a hint, if it's flavored with something, it's because it's not good and they're trying to cover up a bad bean or a bad roast. Remember your uh, cloth there, Chef? Yeah, really absolutely. Um, but really good coffee will have a sense of terroir to it, where it was grown. And chocolate will too. So you're looking, it's a fruit, and so you're looking for a really nice fruitiness to the chocolate. And if, going back to the eggs, if you taste a chocolate and you're like, that's a really good chocolate. It'll make a really good truffle. And you can try and experiment with different kinds of chocolates. Try one from Ecuador. Try one from Guatemala. Try one from Mexico. Try one from Java. You'll start to experience the, uh, the finer qualities of something that I think we kind of take for granted a little bit in society. But it's just a t yeah, taking that time to appreciate it and, yeah. and learning. Yeah. So I'm just actually going to hold this up. You can actually see. But the, uh, the air in that meringue is definitely helping float on top of the alcohol. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're definitely going to be wanting to incorporate and mix it in. Yep. Um, so, Chef, I'm going to... Melody, how is the bourbon? Tell us about your bourbon, actually, because speaking of going back to terroir and everything, if you have a really nice bourbon, no two bourbons are alike. There's good reason for that. Um, how they handle the mash, where it was grown, so on and so forth. So, so. tell us about your bourbon. So I'm actually, for Chef John, to just enrich that flavor profile a little bit, mm -hmm. add a little bit more spice, which this is actually going to have. This is a Glen Farkless 15-year Highland whiskey. Highland. Highland. The Scottish Highlands? Scottish Highlands. Just a wee little bit. Just a um, wee little bit. Highland scotches generally will have a um, very varied set of different flavor profiles, whereas the other regions... Um, generally stick to certain styles like sweeter, smoother, more caramel, or that smoky peaty scotch from Islay. Um, Island scotches can be all over the map. Mm. So this one is kind of a nice in-between with just a little bit of spice. That's mainly the rum, but this is just going to help round out the flavor. And if okay. doesn't like it, I'll finish it. Everyday use bourbon, Mr. Jack. Yeah, and if you like Mr. Daniels, then go for it. Because once again, similar to the egg, similar to the chocolate, if you don't like the taste of what the alcohol that you're using is on its own, you're not going to like it in the eggnog. And I think that's a key point for anything that you're cooking. If you don't like the taste of anything that's going in, it's not going to be good. So you always know best by your own taste buds. Um, and just to, for everyone at home, just to knowing with the ratios that I'm putting in, this is actually a four ounce ladle. So I'm actually putting eight ounces of the nog to one ounce total of alcohol. Mm -hmm. So we're not, you know, not trying to make it a super, super boozy one, but we're just trying to bring out some of those flavors and blend it well. Um, kind of like folding in a meringue, sometimes uh, stirring in drinks, you want to just go around the outside, go through the middle. And that way I'm also not breaking up all that Nice air that Chef John put in. Oh, that's fine. Between you and me, Chad, that was the first time I was trying putting meringue into eggnog. Yeah, but you know what? We're going to taste it. We're going to see. 
Yeah, worst case we just let it deflate a bit. Yeah, worst case is that we just act like we were planning it the whole time. <laughs> it was the <laughs> TV magic. Wait, is my microphone on? What? Uh -oh. Oh, hi, everybody. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Okay, and so this one is mine. Yep. I'm gonna, but it has but, not been spiced yet. Oh, it hasn't been spiced yet. Okay, how you do you are the keeper of the nut? The oh, nutmeg. the nutmeg. Yeah, nutmeg. Nutmeg. Da -na -na -na, nutmeg. Oh yeah. Look at that. Got Ooh. some nutmeg. Making it. Oh, I can smell that. Oh yeah. Nothing like keeping it fresh, Chab. You know, and you can use some cinnamon. You can play with other spices. I, in the right amount, I love a little bit of anise or some fennel. Ooh. But, but preferences. Preferences. Preferencias for anybody who speaks Spanish. Hola, como estas? Como te fue la vida? There we go. So I'm just going to. Mm -hmm. All right, Chad. Cheers, Jeff. Merry Christmas. <laughs> and so, oh, a good. What was it? Good night. Mm. Mm. That's pretty tasty. It's eggnog. Not not delicious. <laughs> Use your noggin. But one of the things I think we can all agree on is that it's better than the stuff that comes in the store. Oh, yeah. Like, way better than the stuff that's in the store. And I'm in control of it, or you're in control of it, right? You have the wheel. You have the power. No, what I what I like about this is I can I can taste the flavor. It feels a lot smoother. Yep. Um, a different mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. And that, that's something that we talk a fair amount about with, with beverages and things like that, but... It, it does make a difference. The alcohol, or if you put in the simple syrup, will play around with that mouthfeel a little bit. Yeah. The alcohol being thinner than water, it does dilute it down a little bit. Yeah. It makes it less viscous. Um, whereas the syrup might make it a bit thicker. So you just play around a little bit with how, how you like your, uh, your nog. Exactly. That's nice. That's and sick. then Ooh. I'll demonstrate one more time. Yes. My ganache is solid. It's not even falling off of the spoon. So take the amount that you want to create, the size that you want to create. The last one I made for my chef was like a golf ball. It'd be greater, better if you had like a little mini golf club to like push it through. Exactly. So I'm just going to, my ganache isn't quite ready. Sorry to hear that, Marilyn. But this is what you'll do. You'll take your ganache once it's able to be formed. Okay, I'm going to get a close up there for you, chef. Yeah, and form it into a ball as best as you can and... I'm using the gloves because my gloves are getting I was, kind I was of... going to say, I, I can see why you chose to go with gloves. Yeah. That being said, if you're making Opening the yourself... whiteboard. Oh, Wendy's whiteboard. Okay. What's going on on the whiteboard, Wendy? And today on Wendy's whiteboard... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Cool. So, yeah, we got our little nugget. I was going to toss it into the cocoa. Roll it around in the cocoa. Some people go cocoa for truffle puffs. Accident. It's okay, Wendy. And there it is. Oh, no. where are we at? Oh. There oh, we are. Here, I'll go back to the oh. back to oh. the other side. Oh. Zoom. It's a good thing I did my my stretches today. My arm is loose and limber. Up, down, touch the ground. Yeah. Okay. And there it is. And then you just you just do that a thousand more times. So here's you know an, here's another one. Just gonna. My ganache is a little too warm, so I'm just going to warm it up in my hands a little bit. Or a little too solid, sorry. Warm it up in my hands a little bit. And here we go. You can kind of think of it as like meatballs, except not meatballs. They're truffles. Dessert meatballs. Dessert meatballs. And once you have a ball that you like, toss it in the cocoa powder, roll it around. Et voila. And then you find a friend like, hey, Chad, would you like a truffle? And oh, do I? I don't know that anybody would say no to that. Nope. And then you go, hey, Chad, would you like this freshly made eggnog to go along with your truffle? Maybe. I might and, be enduring, right? I know. And then you've made friends with people because you know you'll never do that with salad. <laughs> That's right, Colette. You should start a blog and say the best dessert meatballs ever so it counteracts anybody who else creates a recipe for dessert meatballs. And then somebody in the comments will be like, these are truffles. And then you can start 
create an internet fight. Internet fights over food have kind of become my new thing because it's just ridiculous. Like, just Jeff, enjoy the food. It's going to be okay. Jeff Sean does a lot of research for um, various different uh, yeah, recipes, programs, and things like that for us. And because I'll be I'll be looking at different recipes and trying to get to you know the the core of what a recipe is trying to do or say or be or whatever. And um, that leads me to various websites, and sometimes it leads leaves comments. And there are some people out there just passionate about whether something is right or not. It's like, come on. If, if you enjoy it, it's right. Spread food, not hate. Spread food, not hate. Yeah, so I'm just taking my ganache, using a spoon, rolling it up. Oh, yeah. And the nature of them, too, Chef. They don't have to be perfectly round. They just no have to be to the roundness of your desired liking. They just have to somehow manage to make it into the tray. Um... I guess the good news is that if you were to say, like, just start eating a whole bunch of them, you would eventually feel sick, and then there would be that. But yeah, they don't have to be perfect. And I mean, the look on Chad's face has anybody tried their truffles yet? The look on Chad's face said it all. I am willing to try everyone's truffles if mm -hmm. it's a hard task, but I'm up to the challenge. Correct. Now, pop quiz why is it called a truffle? I don't know. Why is it called a truffle, Chef? Because if you bring up the mushroom, ooh, the picture of the truffle, the actual truffle, which is a mushroom, and you put it side by side, <gasps> it looks like the truffle. The gasp. Yeah, that's why it's called a chocolate truffle. Yeah. Pigs hunt them. Yes, they do. Which actually means that even though it's a mushroom, which would be kosher or halal, it's not because pigs touch it. Ooh. Yep. Interesting. I know. Fun facts, right? Cool. And then what you do from here is once you've got your truffles ready, you just put them in the fridge. I think they do have, have trained some dogs to be able to do it, um, to open up and broaden the market. I do know that it has to do with them. Uh, the pigs are generally used because of the way they, they root through things. Yeah. They're very good and gentle at finding them. So, yeah. And dogs, especially my dog. Let me tell you about my dog. But I love her. She, she's lovely. She's just very energetic. She's a, quite an energetic little puppy, yes. She's a husky, and now that there's snow outside, we could lose her outside for hours, and it's like, honey, it's minus 20 outside. Do you want to come inside? And she's out playing in the snow, and... <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm good. Want to go and play? And I'm like, no, it's minus 20 outside. Okay, yeah, you put these in the fridge, and then eat them. How long do they last? Good question. Uh, they're really good, so I don't think they would last for very long, but my Alberta Health Services food inspector answer is seven days. <laughs> with, with proper storage. With proper storage, yes. That's, that's, that's the caveat. But if you think about it, what's in it? Butter and chocolate, and both of those things set out at room temperature when properly stored. Uh, the only thing in here that would be problematic would be the cream, so that's why I recommend putting it in the fridge. Cool. Any questions, comments, concerns? While I sit here and make truffles? No, Chef. If you were to roll it in a different material than the cocoa powder, yes. would it still be a, a truffle or would it just be a, a different? It would still be a truffle. Yeah, at its most basic level, you coat it in cocoa powder. But you can coat them in anything you want. When I signed up, I didn't know that I'd get a comedy show in addition to the cooking class. Bonus! Thanks, John and Chad. You are quite welcome, Lavelle, and it was lovely to have you here. Exactly. And mm -hmm. both Chef John and I have done enough watching of various food programming that we want to keep it interesting and fun for you because that's what it's meant to be. And that's what's the best way you're going to enjoy everything is, is having fun because I guarantee your product is going to be yeah. the best one you're enjoying. Based on ingredients, should be able to freeze too, right? Yeah, totally, Cindy. You could freeze these if you wanted to. Um, and then just obviously let them thaw appropriately. I recommend the refrigerator so that they come to a thaw slower rather than faster. Thanks so much. That was fun. Awesome, Marilyn. A great, great show. Thanks, Wendy. Can you add anything to the ganache mixture? Colette, that's a great answer. Some of these, for example, the hazelnut liqueur would be fantastic to add to the uh, ganache mixture. And again, that's going to depend on how much you want. For the amount that we made here, I would probably recommend no more than a tablespoon of hazelnut liqueur. I'm, you know, it'll make it taste like hazelnut. It's not enough that I think you would get boozed off of. 
But again, you can play with it. Um, but hazelnut liqueur, uh, an almond liqueur. What else goes good with chocolate? An orange liqueur would be really good. Coffee liqueur. Coffee liqueur would be really good. Um, sherry, port. Yeah. Watch out for more cooking demos in the new year with Chef Harrison Chad. Yes, Tammy. For Valentine's Day, we have one coming up. Isn't that right, Tams? I can call you Tams, right? I'm sorry. Tammy. Uh, and we're going to be doing something romantic. Ooh. Yeah. That cooking class is on Actually, February I think one 7, of the things we were talking about doing was incorporating chocolate in a savory sense for, for Valentine's Day. We use some festive sprinkles on some of our truffles. Awesome, yeah. Michelle. I'm, I'm not always a fan, but that's that myself. I, I, you could also use like shredded coconut. What, or... sprinkles? You're going to say that you're not a fan of sprinkles? Uh, sprinkles. Oh, gotta, gotta love sprinkles. Who invited this guy? Who hates sprinkles? Come on. Sh some shredded <laughs> coconut. I'm trying to think of other things that you could do. Uh... He's getting upset. You can hear it. Show us your truffles, Marilyn. Yeah, Marilyn, show us your truffles. Anybody want to show their truffles or their eggnog? Ah, look at that. Love it. You guys did great. This is awesome. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate everyone being here, and we're hoping that you're having some fun. And this yeah. is a great way to, to start off the holiday season for everyone, hopefully. Absolutely. I think so. While you, uh, what do I know, Chad? I'm just gonna do a little bit of plug in for upcoming events here. Perfect. I'm just gonna mute both our mics and uh, let you go ahead. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, again, everyone, thank you so much for attending this event. Uh, it was amazing watching uh, Chef John and Chad whip up uh, these two little creations here. And uh, Wendy, thank you so much for all your uh, thoughtful questions. It kept everybody on their toes. Uh, we have some upcoming events. We have an eating healthy on a budget on January 23rd. Value of mentorship on January 26th. The Valentine's Day cooking demo with Chef John and Chad on February 7th. And tax tips and tricks for the year 2022 on February 9th. Our registration will open up on December 8th. Uh, thank you again to our partner, TD Insurance, uh, and they are a proud sponsor of today's event. Uh, to continue getting some more feedback and information on these events and how we can offer more things like this to you, uh, we're going to send out a quick survey. If you guys wouldn't mind, oh, that looked like a really, really good truffle. <laughs> so just keep your eye out for a survey from us. Uh, and if there is something you'd like to learn or know more about, uh, please feel free to let us know and uh, we'll get in touch with you and try and make that happen. Thank you again for attending. Uh, we will see you at future Nate alumni events. Have a great evening.